Hello, my name is Pamela Cipriano, and I'm a doctorally prepared nurse practitioner at the Practice of Health and Wellness in Thomaston, Connecticut. Today's presentation was given at the Connecticut APRN Society Annual Conference in November of 2023. Although it is targeted towards healthcare providers, the general public, especially anyone who lives in areas where there is a large tick population and anyone suffering or knows someone who's suffering from an array of symptoms without a logical diagnosis. The objectives of this presentation are to properly identify an erythema migraine's rash and identify which of the 14 different tick-borne diseases will produce one. Describe the ramifications of under-prescribing antibiotics. Understand the pathophysiology of the microbes that invade the body. Discuss how persister cells found in tick-borne diseases, also common in leprosy and tuberculosis cause chronic diseases when treatment is not sufficient. Acknowledge the need to listen to your patient's story with an open mind and feel comfortable to educate your colleagues. This is from the CDC site. Lyme disease is the most common vector-borne disease in the United States. Lyme disease is caused by the bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi, and rarely Borrelia myoniae. It is transmitted to humans through the bite of an infected black-legged tick. Typical symptoms include fever, headache, fatigue, and characteristic skin rash called an erythema migraine rash, otherwise known as a bullseye rash. If left untreated, infection can spread to joints, heart, and nervous system. Lyme disease is diagnosed based on symptoms physical findings, and the possibility of exposure to infected ticks. Laboratory testing is helpful if used correctly and performed with validated methods. Most cases of Lyme disease can be treated successfully with a few weeks of antibiotics. We are on the front line. ER providers, pediatricians, primary care providers, and urgent care providers. Lyme disease, if caught early and given at least four to six weeks of antibiotics, can be cured. If that period of time is missed, people will end up with a chronic form of Lyme disease. And this chronic form, this list is not inclusive. The fatigue, the joint pain, the muscle pain, neuropathies, radiculopathies, all the pain associated with that. What I'm seeing a lot of is anxiety, panic attacks, depression, mood disorders. I'm seeing a lot of this. And I did a lot of research on this and found that a vast majority of people who are in behavioral health right now are actually suffering from a tick-borne disease that has been missed and misdiagnosed. So what exactly is the problem? Is it misinformation? Is it mixed diagnoses? Is it under-prescribing? Is it inaccurate diagnostics? Or is it no formal education? There is no formal education on tick-borne diseases. You rarely hear of it, period. When I get information about a conference coming up or a new drug that's on the market, or if I want to um, get some CMEs for my certification, tick-borne disease, Lyme disease, Bor Borrelia burgdorferi, Bartonella, Babesiosis, Ehrlichia, never, ever, ever, ever on the list. Never. When I went away for training, it was because my son was misdiagnosed for so many years, 10 years to be exact, until so he was finally told it was all of his symptoms were in his head. That's a terrible thing to say to anyone. It's even worse when you have to hear that 
for your own self. That's a terrible thing to hear. That all of the symptoms that you're experiencing, they're not really there. It's all in your head. What a terrible thing to say. So after 10 years of me trying to figure out what is going on with my son, I finally found one research article that had his symptoms. And I contacted the researcher who referred me to the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society. I became a member. I went away for training. I went to all the conferences. And my son, thank God, knock on wood, is doing fantastic. So as a provider, what concerns you the most? Is it prescribing antibiotics for a month or longer and you have that uneasy feeling? Is it concerns over antibiotic resistance? Because let's face it, it's not us. Livestock get more antibiotics than a practitioner can ever prescribe to their patients. And there's no regulations on them at all at all is it promoting c difficile is it misdiagnosing a treatable condition that can lead to lifelong health issues that should be what concerns providers the most right there d that's what should be concerning you the most So out of curiosity, because there's such a discrepancy in how long a person should be on, let's say, doxycycline for a tick-borne disease, we have 10 days, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, pick one. For the heck of it, I decided to do a little bit of research to find out just how long the average person is put on doxycycline for pimples. I was amazed. Pimples. The average person is prescribed two years of doxycycline two years two years for something that is not going to take your life two years what is the average amount of time a provider will prescribe doxycycline for a tick bite the average amount of time the average for a tick bite Two weeks. Two weeks for something can that can become become a disabling condition. Disabling mentally, physically, emotionally. Two weeks. So the Infectious Disease Society of America recommends two weeks after an erythema migrans rash is noted. No, noting only 20 to 50 percent of people are lucky enough to get that erythema migraine's rash. And when they do get it, it doesn't look like a perfect bullseye, so it's usually misdiagnosis cellulitis. ILADS, the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society, recommends four weeks after a tick bite with or without an erythema migraine's rash. Automatically, four weeks. The CDC, from their site, recommends a few weeks after a clinical diagnosis clinical not laboratory with or without an erythema migraine's rash a few is greater than two and less than five that's a few so let's do some comparisons here we have two years for pimples which are painful unsightly and can cause scarring and we have two weeks for lyme disease which can cause chronic pain neurological disorders, cardiac abnormalities, memory impairment, tremors, myalgia, arthralgia, psychiatric illnesses, as I mentioned, panic attacks, anxiety attacks, depression, mood swings. There are stages of Lyme disease like stages of so many other disease processes. There's the early localized phase or stage which is the erythema migraine's rash. Like I said, 20 to 50% of people are fortunate enough to get this. And usually flu-like symptoms, almost like they call it the summer flu. Body aches, headache, fever. If this is treated early and appropriately, this will not progress to the other stages of Lyme disease. Early disseminated Lyme disease is when the 
central nervous system is involved. This a lot of times is misdiagnosed as multiple sclerosis. There's migrating pain, there's cardiac involvement, there's numbness to extremities, there's um, difficulty grasping onto things. So there's some, there's some um, fumbling, which is another sign of, of multiple sclerosis, dropping things, multiple sclerosis. And then the late stage of Lyme disease is the Lyme arthritis the knee that has to get drained, the elbow that's always causing pain, the migrating muscle pains, migrating weakness, migrating neurological or, or, or uh, radiculopathy from the, uh, the nerve pain, um, memory issues, disabling, disabling complications from this tick-borne disease. That's a late stage. So one tick can carry up to 18 different diseases. One tick. The only disease from a tick that causes the erythema migrans rash is Lyme disease. There's Lyme disease, Borrelia. There is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. There is Q Fever. There's a Powassan virus, very deadly. There is anaplasma, ehrlichiosis, tularemia, brucella, hemorrhagic fever, Bartonella, babesiosis, a parasite. I've had people pass roundworms in their stool from a tick bite because the ticks carry larvae, which can get into your system. I really want everybody to understand how serious a simple tick bite can be. How serious this can be. Currently, there's a two-step analysis. The ELISA is done first. It's a screening tool. If the ELISA is negative, that person is never tested for Lyme disease. ELISA is only for Lyme disease. If the ELISA is negative, the provider never has an opportunity to actually see which bands are positive and which bands are negative. Furthermore, the ELISA within the first few weeks is about 35 to 50% accurate. 35 to 50% accurate. Why would I even ever use that test? It's garbage to me. That's for the IgM. That's your two out of three bands. The IgG, five out of 10 bands, that's about 75 to 89%. Sensitive. 75 to 89%. Do you know what the College of American Pathologists say? They say that you need a test that is going to pick up at least 95% of people with that disease process. 95%. I don't know about you, but in my book, 75 to 89% is not 95%. And 35 to 50% is so far away from 95%. But I have had arguments with physicians from the IDSA because I had a patient, no lie, 10 out of 10 IgM bands, 10 out of 10 were positive. But because I didn't do the ELISA, they said it wasn't a positive test. Whoo, what the heck? <laughs> I can't even wrap my arms around that one. Can't even do it. So let's get back to this. This two-step analysis is an antiquated method of testing. It was used with guidelines from the 1990s. That's a long time ago in my book. There are now over 100 strains of Borrelia in the United States and over 300 species worldwide that are never tested because Borrelia burgdorferi is the only thing tested in this two-step analysis. There are 300 different Borrelias in the entire world and 100 just the United States. 
So here are some laboratory markers. We have the CD57, which is not specific to Lyme disease, but it is a very strong clinical test to be run because if that test is low, you are never going to get a positive Lyme disease. Lyme testing, it's the only test that is made to test your immune system's ability to identify that you have this tick-borne disease. If your immune system is in the toilet, that test is going to be negative. So if your CD57 is 10, like in my son's case, I have never had a patient that low before and I haven't had one since. He did not start testing positive until he was on antibiotics for two years and his CD57 reached 59. That's when I finally got a positive result for Lyme disease. Two years later, because that's how long this kid had Lyme disease. He was bitten at six years old, had a bullseye rash on his calf, brought him to the pediatrician. If I had a guess, he was put on 10 days worth of antibiotics, which clearly doesn't work. There is no research to suggest that 10 days or two weeks of antibiotics does anything to get rid of all of the bacteria from a tick bite. There's no concrete literature, peer reviewed literature to, to even suggest that that's a long enough period of time. So after having this bacteria in a system for so long at the age of 19, we went scuba diving and he had a lot of abdominal pain while we were about 100 feet down. Now he'd been scuba diving since he was 12. So bring him to his doctor who refers him to a surgeon who opens him up and finds that this very strong 19 year old Italian man has Swiss cheese abdominal wall. That's how it was described, Swiss cheese, because the bacteria uses your connective tissue as energy it eats away at your connective tissue we could not figure out why he had holes in his abdominal wall at such a young age with such a robust testosterone level and him being a singer a musician a football player there was no reason for something like this it wasn't until after I went away for training that I learned why this all happened to him. Because before that, nobody could figure it out. His pediatrician couldn't, the surgeon couldn't. Nobody could figure it out. So let's get back to this. So the CD57 has to be at least 60 to 360. But if you really want a really, really healthy immune system, it should be at least 120 or higher. Igenix, which is state of the art laboratory testing. Interestingly, it was always for tick-borne diseases, and now they've included COVID as well, because COVID is another uh, testing phenomenon that does never seem to come back positive, even though people have every clinical sign of COVID. Same thing. Local testing, Western blot or immunoblot, blot, if you review the bands, forget the ELISA, that two-step analysis in my book, Throw it out. Anything that is only about 35 to 50% or 75 to 89%, why bother? You're going to get a negative, which is never going to get, the patient's never going to get tested for Lyme disease. You're never going to be able to actually visualize those bands. Why would you put a patient at risk like that? That makes no sense to me at all. The most prominent bands in Lyme disease are bands 31 and 34. These two bands are not in local testing. They have been removed. However, when the testing criteria for laboratory testing first came out in the 1990s, 31 and 34 were included. So that would make sense with that two out of three and the five out of 10 because 31 and 34 were included. Well, when they made the vaccine back in the 90s, they pulled those two bands out of testing because they were used to make the vaccine. And they didn't want any possibility that a patient might be mistakenly diagnosed for Lyme disease because they got the vaccine. So if you had 31 and 34 in your blood work, 
to me, it would be a simple question. Did you get vaccinated with Lyme, with Lyme ricks? If the answer is yes, we can say, okay, you may or may not have Lyme disease <coughs> because they use bands 31 and 34. So we'll have to wait and see how things go and we'll get some more testing done, yada, yada, yada. They didn't give providers or practitioners that ability to do that. They just took those two bands out of testing. So trying to get five out of 10 bands that was really specific to Lyme disease now is impossible because there's not that many bands in there to equal five. So this is the five out of 10 for the IgM. Bands 18, 23, 28, 30, 39, 41, 45, 58, 66, 83, and 93, depending on the laboratory you're using. The only ones that are specific to Lyme disease are 23, 39, 83, and 93. They're interchangeable. That's it. So we have three bands right there. You could have all three bands positive and all the other ones negative and you will be told that you have a negative Lyme test because you don't have five out of 10 bands positive. You can have 18, 28, 30, 41 and 45 positive, which have nothing to do with Lyme disease. And you're told that you have Lyme disease because you have five out of 10 bands positive. Do you see where I'm coming from with this? Is this making sense? Because if it does, let me know because it's not making sense to me. The current two out of three IgM and five out of 10 IgG test is only for epidemiological purposes. This was never meant to be used as a diagnostic tool for diagnosing and treating Lyme disease. Never go on the CDC site. Lyme disease, according to the CDC, is a clinical diagnosis. Now, let me back up a minute. The Infectious Disease Society of America made them take that statement down back in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, and it didn't go back up until about a year ago. Mostly because there's another vaccine on the market. That's my own personal opinion. So poor testing is not the main problem. The problem is there's no formal training on Lyme disease. Where are people supposed to get their information from? Unless you have a family member or a patient that you really are trying to fix, you have no reason to really go out there and stick your neck out on a line to try and figure out what's going on with Lyme disease. I mean, really? For me, I had a reason. I brought my son into this world and I was keeping him here. And honestly, if I didn't diagnose him when he, when I did, I'm not sure how much longer he would have lasted. You can only be sick for so long with no diagnosis before you just start giving up hope. This is way too true, way too true. Your husband's rash is too irregular to be lying. This is what a Lyme bullseye looks like as per the American Archery Association. As funny as this is, this is so sad. It's so real. I cannot count how many people have walked through my door with this story. And luckily for them, they're smart and they take pictures. So by the time they see me, I have pictures to actually go by to see what did the rash look like. So a bullseye rash does not need to look like a perfect bullseye. Listen to your patient's story. I have seen every one of these rashes and every one of these rashes is pretty much in my case studies that I'm gonna be presenting in a few minutes. We have a blistering lesion, which looks more like a spider bite, an abscess. We have the uniformly red lesion that can be pretty much anything, including uh, ringworm. We have the blue and red lesion, which looks like a bruise. We have the typical bullseye rash, a little irregular there, so I'm sure somebody would be com complaining about it now looking like a perfect bullseye. And then we have the disseminated lesions. The disseminated lesions are patches of redness 
pretty much all over the body, which is frightening. And I'll tell you why in a little while. So the immune system and tick saliva are the reason why we cannot get ahead of this tick-borne problem. As the tick prepares to bite, the bacteria is moving up from the stomach of the tick into the mouth and mixing with the saliva. When the tick bites you, there's an anesthetic quality to that bite so you don't feel the bite like you would like a mosquito bite. You don't feel that bite. The saliva has enzymes that hide the bacteria from the immune system. It's literally incognito. The immune system has no idea that there's an intruder in the body for up to two weeks or more. Only 20 to 50% of people are going to get that bullseye rash. And for those fortunate enough to get the rash, only about 10% of these people are going to be treated properly. The remaining people have just been served a lifelong sentence of disability unless they can find a provider who is trained to identify and treat properly tick-borne diseases. This is classic. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm switching my Lyme disease doctor. What's your availability look like next week? When a dog gets bitten by a tick or a horse gets bitten by a tick, they are automatically put on one month of antibiotics. When they go in with a little bit of a lame leg or they're, they're, they have a little bit of what feels like arthritis in their hip, immediately tested for Lyme disease. There are so many other reasons why we're so much kinder to the animal community, including on the, you know, at the, the uh, moment of death than we are to humans. And I don't understand this at all. How are veterinarians so much more educated on tick-borne diseases than human beings? I love my dogs. I have six. I have a cat. We rescue animals. But they're not, they rely on us. They're not running the world. We need better understanding, better education, and smarter providers that are not going to only go by what they're taught. We need providers who are going to look outside that box and try and figure out what is going on with this person. It was not medical books. It's not in the, the latest AMA, uh, CME that you just, you just uh, certification classes that you just went to. Look outside the box. Look at other countries. See what they're doing. We are not the be all end all. I know we're very much would love to think that. Very arrogant Americans. But believe me, the other countries seem to have a better handle on a lot of different things than we do here. So, if I were going to write a board exam question, this is what it would be. Patient presents to your office with a discolored circular rash located on the right posterior shoulder. She tells you she works as a camp counselor at a local summer camp. She also states that she thinks it may be Lyme disease because three other people in her camp have Lyme disease. After evaluating the patient and examining the rash, next slide. What is the correct answer? Here's the rash. You have a little bit of central clearing, a little bit of redness, more oval than round, ringworm, cellulitis, Lyme disease, or psoriasis? Lyme disease. Second, second part of the question, before deciding on a diagnosis, should you do blood work to determine if it's Lyme disease? Yes or no? No. Why? 
It's a circular round rash and greater than five centimeters. She works as a camp counselor. Prior to four weeks, you will get a false negative result. The test measures the antibodies identified by your immune system. The tick saliva keeps the bacteria incognito for at least two weeks. That means your immune system may not even identify that there is anything abnormal in its path within the first four week period. And just for edification, it is Lyme disease. Lyme disease patients know their verbiage. Where did you get your Lyme disease? Where did you get your medical degree? It's a good question. So my first case study, 24 year old female works as a camp counselor, goes to the Hartford Hospital Urgent Care in Torrington, explains that three other people at her camp were diagnosed with Lyme disease. She's sent home with a diagnosis of cellulitis versus ringworm with no antibiotics. I don't know about you, but when I have a patient with cellulitis, I give them antibiotics. This is the patient we just saw with my board certifying question. She returns the next day with pain to the shoulder now. She is examined by a different provider. She's diagnosed with cellulitis and a circle is drawn around the rash and she still has not gotten any antibiotics. She returns two days later to the same urgent care center. I'm thinking I probably would have changed urgent care centers if it was me. The provider tells her that without blood work, there is no way to know if she has Lyme disease, but gives her a two week supply of doxycycline. I cannot blame the provider. There's no formal education. Unless you're taught what I'm telling you right now about the saliva with the tick and incognito to the immune system and how long it takes for that Lyme disease test to actually come back positive, how are you supposed to know? This is what it was. See how it's now outside of the area where that circle was originally made. Very fortunately for her, she calls my stepdaughter who used to work at the same camp and sends her the photos that I just showed you. By now, she's complaining of right shoulder pain, fever, chills, joint pain, and malaise. Emily, my stepdaughter, sends me the pictures. I had her come in for a visit. This is what it looked like when I saw her. I got basic blood work, CBC, CMP, all with the normal limits. Why didn't I order a Lyme test? I'm hoping you can, you can answer that question yourself. It's greater than five centimeters. It's less than four weeks. The saliva from the tick is gonna keep the bacteria incognito from your immune system. You're gonna get a negative result. So treatment for her, and this is for almost everybody with Lyme disease, I pretty much do the same thing. I use serapeptase, which is a derivative of silkworms. For a silkworm to break open out of the cocoon and become a moth, it needs to excrete serapeptase to eat away at that cocoon. Serapeptase taken internally by a human being will actually eat away anything that is a non-living organism. Biofilm is non-living. So I use serapeptase to break open the biofilm that was created 24 hours after the tick bite. When the tick bites you, it uses your proteins to create this biofilm and then hides in the biofilm so that if antibiotics are given, it cannot be killed. Nothing can penetrate this biofilm. That's why we give serapeptase to try and break it open. Liquid stevia to help kill off the immature and persister cells located in the biofilm. So when they're given together, they have a synergistic effect. We have the serapeptase that's breaking open the biofilm, and we have the liquid stevia that is killing off all those persister cells. Minocycline, she works as a camp counselor. She's less likely to develop sun poisoning than she would with doxycycline. 
And we want to cover the intracellular forms of bacteria, so that's going to be the doxycycline. I usually also prescribe cefuroxime for the cell wall forms, where we have that beta-lactam wall we need to penetrate. Doxycycline can't penetrate that. However, the doxycyclines or the tetracyclines are going to cover the vast majority of tick-borne diseases. It's going to cover the, the Borrelia, all forms of Borrelia. It's going to cover Brucella, Tularemia, Anaplasma or Lichiosis, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Q Fever, and a few other things. What it won't cover is Babesiosis, which is a parasite that resides in the red blood cell and can cause hemolytic anemia, very similar to malaria. And it also won't cover completely Bartonella. Bartonella needs a few different things to be able to kill that off, and that's one of my least favorite of all of the tick-borne diseases. Not that I have a favorite. Another Lyme disease claim. Deny. Deny. Sir, it's your mother. Insurance companies, don't get me started on insurance companies, but when it comes to Lyme disease or any tick-borne disease, they want nothing to do with it. There have been so many providers who have lost their license because of insurance companies because they don't want to pay for treatment. They don't want to pay for treatment. We need to do something better in this country than insurance companies because the only ones getting richer are the CEOs of the insurance companies. And the only ones getting poorer are the rest of us trying to make these premiums just to have our claims denied. So something really has to change. Case study number two. 62 year old female works as a respiratory therapist at a local hospital. While driving, she felt something bite the back of her calf, which is kind of frightening to be honest with you. She developed an abscess and went to the emergency department, which they said it seemed to be healing. She was doing the warm compresses. It wasn't getting infected. She was draining it on her own, keeping it open, doing a great job. Shortly after that, about two weeks later, she developed that disseminated migraines, erythema migraines rash, where it's those, it's the bullseye rashes all over the body. The only place it wasn't was on her face. It was from her neck down, on her breasts, her abdomen, her stomach, her back her extremities. When there is disseminated migraine, erythema migraine rash, that means that when that tick bit you, that bacteria got into your nervous system and it is throughout your entire body. Another thing that'll happen is if you happen to see that you got bit by a tick on your right ankle, but you develop a bullseye rash on your left shoulder, that's another disseminated form of Lyme disease. It went through your nervous system. It's much more difficult to get rid of. So, she develops a disseminated erythema migraine rash and she goes back to the emergency department where she was diagnosed with ringworm. Ringworm runs rampant in Connecticut, let me tell you now. This is her rash. This is not a great picture. This was actually uh, put into an old system in my, my EHR system, and it took me a long time to find it because I called her for the pictures, explaining to her that I was going to be doing this presentation, and she, she got rid of the pictures. So this is kind of like a copy of a copy of a copy from the EHR system that I was able to pull up. So after seeing um, the ER, she develops joint pain in profound fatigue. She still has all the rashes and while she's doing her rounds as a respiratory therapist, she happens to see a hospitalist making rounds as well and shows her the rashes and she agrees it's ringworm. Thank God she called my office for another opinion. Thank God. She had disseminated erythema migraines rash. The bacteria travel throughout her nervous system. I already explained about, you know, getting bit on the right ankle and it producing the erythema migraine rash on the left shoulder or wherever else on the body. 
if she did not call my office and get treated, this would have caused severe disability, severe disability. And she would have been misdiagnosed countless times. But because she felt the bite, I was really concerned about a spider bite now carrying Lyme disease. I have not seen any evidence of this in any of the peer reviewed research articles. A little bit skeptical still. It could also have been a dog tick or a lone star tick because they're larger than the very tiny, tiny um, black legged tick. So spiders also carry Bartonella and so do the other ticks. They also carry Bartonella and Bartonella, as I said earlier, is one of my least favorite of all of the tick borne diseases. So testing was done locally because now we're outside that four to six week period. Testing was done locally and then through Igenix as well. Um, results for Igenix, IgM, she had bands 23, 31, 34, 39 positive. IgG, bands 31, 34, and 93 were positive. She was also positive for Bartonella and she was also positive for babesiosis. In her CD57, which was the one I told you about, about your immune system, it should be 60 to 360, but 120 and higher is best. That was a very normal number and that's why she actually tested out positive. If she got bitten, let's say two years ago and her CD57 was 20, there's a good possibility that her testing through Igenix would have been negative. So because she had disseminated form of Lyme disease and she had Bartonella and she had babesiosis, she kind of got hammered with all of the treatments that we had to give her. So doxycycline was double dosed, so 200 milligrams twice a day. So 100 milligrams of doxycycline once or twice a day is bacteriostatic. It prevents the bacteria from growing any further and your immune system is supposed to come in and kill off the rest. Bactericidal is when you're giving at least 200 milligrams twice a day. And that is killing the bacteria, regardless of what your immune system is doing. She was given cefuroxime to cover the cell wall forms, 500 milligrams twice a day. Azithromycin for the atypicals, the Bartonella, and it was also used for babesiosis. She was given liquid stevia for the um, persister cells, serapeptase to break open the biofilm, monolaurin, which has some research is suggesting that it can help to prevent the um, round body formation, the round body formation or cyst formation or L form, lots of different names for it, is when the bacteria, which is shaped like a spirochete, it's, a, it's shaped like a uh, corkscrew, it's called a spirochete, will roll up into a ball and can stay there hiding all the receptors on the belly of the bacteria for up to two years. And for up to two years, they will not be killed off with the antibiotics. And then two years later, they unravel and they start the whole process all over again. So I try and make sure I give monolaurin. There's not great research to suggest that it does this, but you know, monolaurin is a great uh, antimicrobial from nature, it comes from coconut, it's not going to hurt the person. I also told her to start food grade diatomaceous earth, which is an antiparasitic. And she was started on hydroxychloroquine 200 milligrams twice a day for the babesiosis, which is a cousin to malaria. Treatment for her lasted six to 12 weeks. And then we switched everything over to all natural antimicrobials as well as probiotics. When I gave this presentation in November, I had submitted my PowerPoint presentation two weeks earlier. And what I was supposed to say at this point was, now that there is another vaccine on the horizon and there is, I take that back. I got ahead of myself. I apologize. What I was supposed to say was that there is a there is a vaccine in the horizon in about another two years it's going to be coming out. And because there's going to be money made from this vaccination, I can bet my bottom dollar that the CDC is going to come out and say that there is something called chronic Lyme disease. 
So before I even had a chance to get to that point, the CDC came out and said that there's something called chronic Lyme disease before I even gave my presentation. So I had to change it up just like I did right now. So chronic Lyme, no chronic Lyme. Chronic Lyme, no chronic Lyme. Remember the Daisy thing? He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Given the new D CDC numbers and those infected with Lyme disease annually, the organization has ramped up their efforts to get to the bottom of things. Silly, but not silly. So case study number three. 49-year-old female who works as a bus driver, this is one of my favorite ones, presents for a telehealth visit with her provider using video and voice. She explains that where they take their breaks, it is infested with ticks and that they literally fall from the trees. She further explained that she found when crawling out from under her sleeve while she was visiting her daughter-in-law, two weeks Later, she developed this rash on her chest. This is, she just told her provider everything I just said to you and then showed her this rash. The provider tests her for Lyme disease. She got bit two weeks earlier. What do you think the test result is going to be? Negative. So, the provider tells her that the test is negative and that it must be ringworm and she prescribes her an antifungal cream. Two weeks of using the cream, the patient develops severe joint pain throughout her entire body. She has a second telehealth visit with the same provider who tells her she must have, wait for it, Developed arthritis. Yep, she developed arthritis throughout her entire body. Four weeks after getting bitten by a tick. But it's not arthritis. I mean, I'm sorry. It's not, not Lyme disease. It's arthritis that developed. And she's referred to a rheumatologist. She tells her daughter-in-law, who happens to work for me, and is encouraged to come in for a visit. She was started on antibiotics immediately and developed severe weakness, severe dizziness, difficulty standing. Her legs felt like rubber. Primary care doctor who misdiagnosed her told her that Lyme does not present like this and instructs her to go to the hospital. While hospitalized, the neurologist gets neurosurgery involved. This is, I'm not making this up. Infectious disease believes this is a tick-borne disease. Thank God. After several calls that I made to the hospital to speak with infectious disease or neurology, no one returned my call. I even faxed them the lab results that showed that she was positive for Lyme disease and babesiosis. I'm sure they shredded it. And that was local testing. That was not hygienics testing. The hospital labs were normal. So she gets an MRI of her entire spine. Her neck shows degenerative disc disease. I have the report. She calls her daughter-in-law frightened that they're about to take her to surgery to do surgery on her cervical spine. She finally agrees as I am begging her over the uh, phone on speaker to please not have anybody touch her spine. She, she finally refuses surgery. She's transferred to a rehab center where she recovers and is able to walk. She's discharged from the skilled nursing facility and is evaluated by another neurosurgeon outside of that hospital arena for cervical spine surgery and he tells her to never have anyone do surgery on her cervical spine because there's nothing to do surgery on and then goes on to say return to the doctor who diagnosed you with Lyme disease. She was treated successfully for three months in a silly little walk and talk and drive a bus. Oh, thank you, nurse. 
You've retrieved all of his Lyme disease records. No doctor, but I'll get the rest. These poor people, this is exactly what comes in my office. Boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of medical records because they are their own advocate. No one is advocating for them. They keep every single lab test, every consult, every hospitalization, anything they can get their hands on to try and piece it together themselves because they're being told this is all in their head. That's disgusting. Case study number four. The last one was my favorite one. This is by far my saddest one. 54 year old patient presents to my office in a wheelchair. She states, and I have all her medical records, of course, boxes and boxes and boxes of them to substantiate what she's telling me. She states in May of 2014, she felt something on the back of her leg for a few days and thought it was a skin tag. With no hand mirrors in the house and no full length mirrors, she finally took a picture with her phone. She went to a local ER, which was a teaching hospital, and was told the tick will back out when it's ready and no antibiotics are needed. Yeah, that's pretty much what happened to me when she told me that. I think my brains hit the ceiling. This is what she walked into the ER with. This is the picture she took with her camera. Four months later, she developed back pain and leg weakness, generalized fatigue and paresthesias. She was referred to a neurologist. She showed him the picture that I just showed you. He was certain it was Lyme disease, but because there's no formal training, he didn't trust his judgment and sent her to the Mandel Center where they diagnosed her with MS. Do you remember several slides ago when I said the beginning stages of Lyme disease and MS mirror each other? They mirror each other. She is currently five foot eight and weighs 98 pounds and is wheelchair bound. Early Lyme and MS have similar symptoms. In fact, Lyme disease causes demyelination in the brain and spinal cord with slightly different distribution than MS. And MS is not the only disease process that produces oligoclonal ban uh, bands. They're not, it's not the only one. So this poor, unfortunate soul was seen in my office on Thursday, October 12th. She came in on Monday, October 16th to have Igenix Labs drawn. And at that time, treatment was still pending. Since then, she has been working diligently to get grants to be able to continue her treatments with me because we can't take insurance with Lyme disease. Insurance companies won't pay for it. Did you know, my personal experience, I'm not saying this is for everyone, my personal experience, rheumatologists have stated to me, when I've had a patient that I thought had Lyme disease, okay, the rheumatologist states that that patient can have rheumatoid arthritis with a negative RA factor, okay? This patient had a negative Lyme disease all the clinical symptoms of it, but the testing was negative. Didn't do it through Igenix at that point, and the CD57 was only 27, okay? That same patient had a negative RA factor, but according to the rheumatologist, you can have rheumatoid arthritis with a negative RA factor. You cannot have Lyme disease with a negative Lyme test. It's impossible, okay? Neurologist. Patient can have MS without oligoclonal bands. Did you know that? But a patient can't have Lyme disease with a negative Lyme test.
You see where I'm going with this. No formal education. 1998, Lyme Rix made it to market. The first Lyme vaccine for humans. Because in 1998, Lyme disease was thought to be a very serious disease, so they had to come up with this vaccine. I mean, now the IDSA says you give it by a tick, two weeks of antibiotics, you're fine, you're done, never have to worry about it again. Except if you had a specific gene, that vaccine was going to give you Lyme disease. But because of the cost analysis, it was too costly to test everybody for this specific gene. And because they felt that only about 2% of the population was going to actually have this gene, if they developed Lyme disease, it wasn't going to be, I don't know how to say it, that big of a deal. I don't even know how to say that. I mean, to me, one person with Lyme disease is a big deal. To make matters worse, because this was a vaccination, if you did get Lyme disease from it, you can get rid of it. Okay. So it got pulled off the market. This was the advertisement. This is the original advertisement. I got Lyme disease last year and I am being treated for serious health problems. I couldn't prevent it then, but now you could. Protect yourself and your family with Lyme Rix, the world's first vaccine to prevent Lyme disease. Call your doctor now. Take it seriously. Call your doctor now about Lyme Rix. When this vaccine got pulled off the market because it actually was giving people, small percentage of people, but still, Lyme disease. Lyme disease was easily treated after that. It was amazing. It was like a miracle. The vaccine got pulled off the market and... All of the problems and complications and seriousness went with it. I'm being so mean right now. I really apologize. So the way I'm seeing it is this. When the vaccine gave more people Lyme disease than the small percentage they thought, it was pulled from the market. Once there was no more money to be made, Lyme disease was no longer looked at as a serious disease process. But guess what? As I said earlier, there's another vaccine on the market. So pretty soon, you're going to start hearing commercial after commercial after commercial about how serious Lyme disease is. And these millions of people who have been suffering with chronic conditions from Lyme disease and ignored by our government and told by their providers that it's all in their head. What's the ramification for them? My personal and professional advice, you don't have to take it. Don't wait for your certifying body. Don't wait for the government. Don't wait for the AMA. Don't wait for big pharma. And dear God, don't wait for the insurance companies to tell you as a practitioner or a patient that something is important enough to pay attention to. You cannot have millions of people with the same issue and it doesn't exist. That's illogical, that's illogical. Use your logic. We're pretty smart people. I have my doctorate degree. All physicians have their doctorate degree. Many nurse practitioners have their doctorate degree. Many PAs have their doctorate degree. We're pretty smart people. Do your own research. Don't go by what other people are telling you. Don't go by your certifying agency. Don't go by the latest information you got. Do your own research. Our patients rely on us as providers. They rely on us to actually help them. I can't tell you how many people come to my office. I stopped taking insurance in 2022. I have more patients that come to me now because I don't take insurance 
because they feel as though the average provider who takes insurance does not care enough to listen to them. And I really correct them. It has nothing to do with that. There is no time. I cannot see a person in 15 minutes. That was one of the reasons I had to stop taking insurance. I cannot see a person in 15 minutes and properly diagnose them because I really listen to my patients. I really listen to what they have to say. Another reason I stopped taking insurance was I was getting these nasty letters from Connecticut and Blue Cross and Blue Shield telling me I was taking too many people off their medications and not prescribing enough medications, except they obviously didn't read my note because they reversed the disease process through diet and exercise. When you come to my office, I treat the entire person, or regardless of what you came here for, I get you off your medications because you don't need the medicines if you actually have a healthy lifestyle. Finally, I got tired of being harassed and decided to not take insurance any longer. These are my references.